Good morning and welcome to our service of worship for August 16th. Isn't that amazing how fast the summer has gone and fall is soon to arrive and kids are going to be back to school, at least, at least some of them. But anyway, uh, just a couple of items of praise. Mary Hubert will be back this morning to play the organ and we're so grateful for her son-in-law, Mike Norbaum, who has been uh, helping us with music during Mary's absence. And also Jerome Carl had a successful pr procedure this week where they implanted a, a defibrillator in his chest and we trust that will do a better job of regulating, you know, the, the beating of his heart. So we're thankful for those two items this morning. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 33, where we find these words, the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Isn't that comforting to know that in the midst of the coronavirus and other chaos that is sweeping across our land, that the plans and purposes of God remain firm and we can trust in him to work them out for our good and for his glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the privilege of gathering to worship, whether it's in our homes, whether uh, a little later it will be at the church or in a parking lot or, you know, the, the video, the live streaming video that Mike will post after the Sunday service. We're so grateful for each of you and your desire to worship the Lord our God. In his name we pray. Amen. One of the hymns I'd like us to think about this morning is one entitled, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid in your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? Who unto, unto the Savior, who unto the Savior, who unto the Savior for refuge hath fled. Here's the great one for this morning. Fear not. I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed. For I am thy God and will give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous, upheld by my righteous, upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. Wonderful words for us to think about this morning. Again, we're following along with the daily Bible readings, and today we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 4, the entire chapter. So we'll, you know, just look at the chapter as we go uh, in the context of the message. We won't read it first and then expound it later. But today from God's Word, Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 4. Uh, for years, God's prophets warned his people about the judgment that was coming because of their failure to repent of their sin and give him the love and the devotion and the obedience he was due. God used the Babylonians and their King Nebuchadnezzar as the instrument of his judgment, handing his people over to the Babylonians to live the next 70 years in captivity in that foreign land. As he had done many times before, the Lord used pagan nations like the Babylonians to accomplish his plans and purposes and to let all nations know that he is Lord over all things and all nations. Chapter 4 begins with Nebuchadnezzar speaking. In verses 1 through thing, one through 3, King Nebuchadnezzar begins his story and gives praise to the Most High God for everything that unfolded in his life up to that point. King Nebuchadnezzar, to those of every people, nation, and language who live in all the earth, may your prosperity increase. I am pleased to tell you about the miracles and wonders of the Most High God, the Most High God has done for me. How great are his miracles, and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Then Nebuchadnezzar recounts his dream in verses 4 through 7. I, Nebuchadnezzar, 
was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I had a dream and it frightened me. While in my bed, the images and visions in my mind alarmed me. So I issued a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon to me in order that they might make the dream's interpretation known to me. When the diviner priests, mediums, Chaldeans, and astrologers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. Verses 8 through 17. Daniel arrives on the scene and the king tells him about the dream. Finally, Daniel, named Belshazzar, this is a name that the king gave him because he was a trusted counselor of the king, named Belshazzar after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods in him came before me. I told him the dream. Bel Shazer, head of the diviners, because I know that you have a spirit of the holy gods and that no mystery puzzles you, explain to me the vision, the visions of my dream that I saw and its interpretation. In the visions of my mind as I was lying in my bed, I saw this. There was a tree in the middle of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew large and strong, its top reached to the sky, and it was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit was abundant, and on it was food for all. Wild animals found shelter under it. The birds of the air lived in its branches, and every creature was fed from it. As I was lying in my bed, I also saw the visions of my mind and observer, a holy one coming down from heaven. He called out loudly, cut down the tree and chop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump with its roots in the ground and with a band of iron and bronze around it in the tender grass of the field. Let him be trenched with dew from the sky and share the plants of the earth with the animals. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal for seven periods of time. This word is a command from the holy ones. This is so the living will know that the Most High is ruler over the kingdoms of men. He gives it to anyone he wants and he sets the lowest men over it. This is the dream that I had, King Nebuchadnezzar had. Now Belshazzar, tell me the interpretation because none of the wise men of my kingdom can make the interpretation known to me, but you can because you have the spirit of the holy gods. In, real, in reality, Daniel could give the king the interpretation of his dream because he had an, in him the spirit of the one true God. He is not one among many gods, but the one true God. Daniel recounts the dream for the king and gives him the interpretation. Verses 19 through 27. Then Daniel, whose name is Belshazzar, was stunned for a moment, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king said, Belshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Let me just add, Daniel is stunned because of the warning that the dream held for Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar answered, My Lord, may the dream apply to those who hate you and its interpretation to your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, whose top reached to the sky was, uh, was vis in, uh, and was visible to all the earth, whose leaves were bountiful and beautiful and its fruit abundant, 
and on it was food for all. Under it the wild animals lived, and in its branches the birds of the air lived. That tree is you, king. For you have become great and strong, your greatness has grown and even reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to the ends of the earth. The king saw an observer, a holy one coming down from heaven, saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump with its roots in the ground and with a band of iron and bronze around it in the tender grass of the field. Let him be drenched with dew from the sky and share food with wild animals for seven periods of time. This is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the sentence of the Most High that has been passed against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals. You will feed on grass like cattle and be drenched with dew from the sky for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is the ruler over the kingdom of men. And he gives it to anyone he wants. As for the command to leave the tree stump with its roots, your kingdom will be restored to you as soon as you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, may, it, may my advice seem good to you, my king. Separate yourself from your sins by doing what is right and from your injustices by showing mercy to the needy, perhaps, there will be an extension of your prosperity. Therefore, verse 27 again, therefore, may my advice seem good to you, my king. Separate yourself from your sins. But King Nebuchadnezzar did not heed Daniel's advice to repent. And God's sentence against him was carried out. Verses 28 through 33. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, the king exclaimed, Is this not Babylon the Great that I have built by my vast power to be a royal residence and to display my majestic glory? Let me pause for just a moment. The truth of Proverbs sixteen eighteen which says pride comes before destruction and arrogant, an arrogant spirit before a fall came crushing down on Nebuchadnezzar's head, uh, beginning again in verse 31. While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar. To you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you you will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals, and you will feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is the ruler over the kingdoms of men, and he gives it to anyone he wants. At that moment, the sentence against Nebuchadnezzar was executed. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. In God's time, King Nebuchadnezzar came to his senses. His sanity was restored. He was a changed man. He gave to the Most High God, the praise and honor he was due. Verses 34 through 37. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, 
raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Here ends the reading from the chapter, Daniel chapter 4, today. Daniel chapter 4 is the account of a man who, for all intents and purposes, saw himself as God. In verse 28, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. He did say that. Quite arrogant. How did God respond? Well, verse 32. You will be driven away from people and you will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. In other words, King Nebuchadnezzar was not willing to honor the Most High God as the only, only God and the sovereign ruler over all kingdoms on earth, including his, the one who raises up and the one who removes kings and rulers as he chooses. It was the great God of heaven who gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream. It was the great God of heaven who provided the interpretation through his servant Daniel. The great God of heaven was the one who humbled Nebuchadnezzar. He was the one who restored Nebuchadnezzar once again to his position of leadership in Babylon. And it was the great God of heaven, the sovereign ruler over all the kingdoms of the world, and Nebuchadnezzar's life. He restored it all. Now that's power. That's control. That's dominion. What's described here in Daniel chapter 4 is God's everlasting dominion or rule over all things, including Nebuchadnezzar's rule and power and sanity. Because ultimately, all dominion belongs to God, the God of the Bible, the triune God we worship and serve. Let me share with you just a couple of takeaways from our passage this morning. The first one, like Nebuchadnezzar, we too often make much of ourselves and our kingdoms. Remember what the king said? Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? By making that statement, Nebuchadnezzar, in essence, was declaring that he was a god. Mighty in power and glory and majesty. You might be thinking, well, I don't have a kingdom. I don't rule over anything, but in reality you do. The essence of the fall 
in the Garden of Eden was that Satan convinced Adam and Eve that they shouldn't assume that what was telling them, what God was telling them was true. They were the ones who had the power and the authority to determine what was true and what was not. In other words, they were not dependent on their creator. They were the masters of their own fate. No one could tell them what to do. They were rulers of their own domains. In reality, we all have our own little kingdoms where we rule, where self is the ultimate authority, where self is the ultimate judge of what is true and what is not. This is the essence of sin, that we are the ultimate authority over our lives, not God, the creator and ruler of all things, like Nebuchadnezzar. That was his mindset. And apart from the redeeming grace of God in Christ, that is ours. That mindset is ours as well. Is not this great Babylon I have built as a royal, as the royal residence, by my mighty power, for the glory of my majesty. As long as pride is on the throne of our lives, we are in rebellion against the true ruler and master over all things. The next takeaway, God will not share his glory with anyone else. As long as pride is on the throne of our lives, we are in rebellion against the true ruler and master of all things. And here's the sentence that was passed on Nebuchadnezzar. You will be driven away from people and will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Making much of ourselves and our kingdoms is in direct opposition to the fact that God is the rightful ruler over all things, including our lives, by virtue of the fact that he is the creator and the rightful ruler over all things, and he will not share his glory with another. Our sinful mindset says, my kingdom, my glory. When our creator says, my kingdom, my glory. Can you see how this conflict is not going to end well for us? As we're told in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Here in Daniel chapter 4, we see how God dealt with an individual who was assuming for himself the glory and the honor that only belongs to the creator and ruler of all things. And so this true God reduced Nebuchadnezzar to a babbling, grass-eating madman for a time to remind Nebuchadnezzar and us that he alone is a sovereign ruler and master over all things verses 31 through 33. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with dew, the dew of heaven, until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. The third takeaway. By his grace, God provided the means of Nebuchadnezzar's redemption. Verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. 
Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. Or as another translation puts it, at the end of the appointed time, at the end of God's appointed time, at the time of God's choosing, God gave King Nebuchadnezzar what he didn't merit or deserve, a change of heart and mind and attitude. By means of divine intervention, the Most High God changed Nebuchadnezzar's heart and outlook and perspective on himself and the one who is the sovereign ruler over all things, individual lives and the lives of nations of the earth. What we have on display here is a picture of heaven-sent repentance and redemption that God would later provide to men and women like us through the redeeming work of his son, as we're told in Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. Can't get that word out. When we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Even though God could have simply destroyed Nebuchadnezzar on the spot for his arrogance, instead he showed him grace and mercy, as he has done us and his son. To what end did the great God of heaven show King Nebuchadnezzar grace and mercy? And to what end does he show grace and mercy to us and his son? that we might give him the glory and the honor he is to. Verses 34 and 35, Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the God of heaven, the King of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. And we could even add destroy. I trust that by his grace you too have come to the point where you can say with King Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven. Because of the grace and the mercy that is yours in Christ Jesus. Amen. Join with me, if you would, in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Another hymn that I'd like us to reflect on as we close. Ye servants of God. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim. And publish abroad his wonderful name, his name, all victorious, of Jesus extol. His kingdom is glorious and rules over all. God ruleth on high, almighty to save, 
and still he is nigh his presence we have. The great congregation his triumph shall sing, ascribing salvation to Jesus, our King. This day, may you, by the grace and mercy of God, proclaim his greatness and his honor and his majesty and the salvation which he has provided in Christ Jesus, his Son, our Lord. Amen. Look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday.